Hey friends, Andy here from the YouTube channel, Your Friend Andy. On the podcast today, I have James Camp. I connected with James on Twitter, and I was fascinated by what he was sharing. So on Twitter, he has 80,000 followers. On his TikTok, he has 25,000. And on his newsletter, NanoFlips, he has nearly 20,000, or maybe more than that by now. Uh, but basically, James teaches you how to buy businesses improve them, and then flip them for profit. And he believes in this so much, he has this very spicy take on Twitter about buying online businesses that I liked. And he says, have less than $25,000 $25, and want to get on track to be wealthy? Well, there is a better option than stocks, crypto, and real estate, dot, dot, dot. So I love the contrarian takes. So if the idea of buying an online business from the comfort of your home and then turning around and flipping it for profit or just enjoying the new income source sounds good to you, then you need to listen to this episode. So James, nice to finally have some video back and forth like connection with you here after Twitter after all these years. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm, I'm actually very, we're dealing with sort of post Black Friday. Um, that sort of that that chaos. We're going into the lull of the holidays, which for me is always annoying because I um, desperately want everyone to be on a hundred percent of the time, and everyone else is very chill for the for the month of December, although probably good and needed. But yeah, I'm great. Thank you for having me, Andy. I appreciate it. And I don't know if you remember our kind of first interactions on Twitter or not. Uh, I actually kind of went back and looked, but uh, our first couple of uh, touches of connection there was uh, debating whether. A uh, million dollars is a lot of money, and sharing our love of uh, we were talking about talking watches a little bit and sharing our love of how beautiful the uh, the Omega Speedmaster Professional uh, Dark Side of the Moon Edition uh, watch yes. is. <laughs> yeah, so that was Just that was stunning kind of, watch. Did we did we disagree? Now I feel I need to go look back. Did we disagree on the million or did we agree? Uh, no, we just we we kind of were on the same page. Like it's not really in the big scheme of things. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's all about context. You're like, yeah, it is all about context. And we kind of met in the middle. But it's one of those fun, you know, fun Twitter discussions that we all have and <laughs> talk about. I mean, once you have millions, is a million a lot less so? But when you have ten dollars, maybe it is. I don't know. Um. um did you ever end up getting the dark side of the moon edition? No. So I've been looking for that watch for a while. I, then I had this epiphany. I, you know, what happened to me with watches, and this is much more of, I think, like a, a deep dive into the psyche. Every time I've wanted something that is a luxury good, I mean, I sit here wearing a $12 t-shirt and Nike gym shorts. You know what I mean? Um, every luxury good I've wanted, except for cars, and I don't know why, um, I have, the moment I could unequivocally just get a bunch of them i was just like eh, and i lost a little bit of interest so for me with watches i had had i had some nice watches years ago probably way before i should have had nice watches when i couldn't afford them and the dark side of the moon one is just one of the only ones that actually is like super aesthetically pleasing to me mm -hmm. and now that you said this it's gonna sit in my mind for the rest of the month and i'm probably gonna have to go chase it down you're welcome but no i never ended up i never ended up getting it Nice. Yeah, it's super cool. I, I did get it. I have a Speedmaster Professional. I've always loved the moon watch. But when I see every time I see online, I see the dark side of the moon one or any of the other special editions. There's some really cool ones. I'm like, man, that is a lot cooler than what I have. So I don't know, maybe long term goals. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then also, I, I wanted to reminisce a little bit here, too, because I think we both kind of share uh, a deep hatred, and maybe that's even being too uh, hyperbolic here, of bad Twitter DM outreach. Oh. I feel like I'm just a handful yeah. of, do you want me to send you this free gift DMs away from yeah, like total I mean, I madness? It's, it's overwhelming. I think that for me, and 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 you see it too, I think I had a couple people reply to that post I did the other day and say like, oh, it's not so bad. Well, it's not so bad when you have 15 followers, you're not getting DM'd like crazy. And it, I'm not that I'm some big influencer or something, but when you play in the business space and you have 80,000 followers, 50,000, 20,000 followers, I mean, you get it all the time. And I think that what's interesting for me is I have done so little outbound in my life, like for sales, right? And I've done a lot of sales and a lot of marketing. And I think that sort of paid is a little bit different, obviously, you know, when you talk about paid traffic and stuff, but like for like, and I have to remind myself that this stuff does work. I have been closed on a cold DM before. I have been closed on a cold email before. Very rarely, probably much more rarely these days than it was forever ago. But the, the difference is for me, and to the point you said, is 
I just want it to be like decently high quality. And when I say that, it's like, do a little, like on Twitter, like just follow me. You can unfollow me right afterwards if you want, but just follow me. Like make me feel like there's some sort of reciprocity here as a, you know, um, it's overwhelming how bad it is. And kudos, you know, the, candidly, a lot of this has to do with like the, the kudos to Alex Ramosi, who is one of the best, who's like the new generation's Russell Brunson. He, he's just as my Russell Brunson and probably Dan Kennedy was the generation before me, you know, was there Russell Brunson. Um, Hermosi's great. He's a fantastic marketer. And his first book, I haven't read his second one, but first book, you know, $100 million offers is such a good book. But really what it did was give a bunch of, people that were totally unqualified to sell something, good sales mechanisms for selling, right? How to create these offers to sell with guarantees and stuff that sort of protected themselves. So you combine that with uh, with some DMing and you end up having just like a prolific, prolific sort of bad DMers out there, I think, uh, cold salespeople. So yes, we share a... I'll go with hatred. We we, we could we could go with hatred for that for sure. Uh, I mean, I think the, the flip side, the positive side of that, at least my big takeaway from that is... You know, you can see that and you can see that some of those people, even despite that badness of the outreach or whatever, they still find some success, some of them in there. So seeing how low the bar is, if you are interested in the actual world of like reaching out to people and like selling things or figuring things out, like there's a way you can look at this and go, that's not what not to do. The bar, the bar is very low. If I can just be above that, that bar, then yeah. I might actually have some real success doing this, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also sort of a rite of passage, so to speak. It's such the much more modern. I I would be a liar if I had, didn't say that when I was a teenager, I wasn't essentially spamming people. You know what I mean? Like when I first discovered the internet, I'm 35. And like my first success online came from blogging. And when I was blogging, there were just these blogging communities. And I would just mass DM people in the blogging communities saying, you should read my article, right? Now, the only reason it paid off is I had a couple articles go viral and stumble upon and dig, and I made some ad revenue because I promise you, like a single view on an article with AdSense on it was not worth it to me. It's more, more ego driven for me. But my, you know, someone posted a thread the other day or a post that was saying, you know, what was the toughest job you had? I can tell you mine. I used to stand in, I had a summer job. I would stand in Times Square in New York City selling comedy tickets. And I can tell you right now, people walking past me, 99% of them had no interest in comedy tickets. So I guess I, that was my cold DM of of my teenage years was the like, hey, do you like comedy? You know, to, to tourists on the streets. But I will say like, it's sort of like a rite of passage. I feel like you have to, and I, I don't mean to be so, I don't want to sound like a monster, but sometimes I will rip somebody apart for what feels just like an offensively bad cold DM. And that's part of, feels like part of the rite of passage to me. You know, like when I, listen, go do it on the street, go do street canvassing, you'll get people to really rip you apart. And you'll, then you'll learn to either hate it or be good at it. Those are the two options. Especially so. in New York City. Yeah. That's got to like Ugh. teach you some, <laughs> that's got to teach you some life lessons. Man, yeah. can we just go like back? Swing bags at me and stuff, you know, like <laughs> that kind of energy for sure. Can we just go back to a world where it was like the epitome of awesome online to go viral on dig.com? Can we just, <laughs> go back yeah. there for a little bit i almost want i want to figure out how we like how do we rally as a crew and buy out dig.com mm -hmm. you know what i mean and like bring it back actually someone sent me this uh like I, I think you could really bring i mean honestly social organic social the discover is essentially what stumble upon was right like you have these viral websites that people found interesting and the more they liked them the more they got shared to the top of the algorithm for the people that liked it right and same with, with dig in some regards right like these were just the precursors to discover or feeds um, for you feeds on social today. And I had that epiphany that I was like, whoa, it's just conceptually the same thing here, you know? So Yep. It all all evolves, but does it get better? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Well, so let's talk about this whole like buying a business online stuff. Uh, but right after we hear a quick word from this episode's sponsor. If you're like me, then you're either a small business owner or you would like to start your own business one day. And when you do that, you're going to need a banking solution that's truly built just for your business. That means no fees, no minimum balances, and no bookkeeping problems when tax season rolls around because why would you wanna make tax season even less fun? That's where Relay comes in. Relay is an online banking and money management platform that's a perfect fit for small businesses and one I recommend. Again, Relay has no account fees, no overdraft fees, and no minimum balances, which means you get to keep more in your pocket. One of my favorite features is that you can get up to 20 individual accounts, including two savings accounts, to organize and allocate income for things like 
day-to-day -day expenses, investments, or taxes. You can now earn up to 3% APY on savings with Relay savings accounts. You can create virtual and physical debit cards for you and your employees in seconds. And best of all, Relay makes your bookkeeping speedy and meticulous by giving you ultra detailed transaction data and directly syncing it back to QuickBooks Online and Xero. And so many more amazing features I don't have time to tell you about here. Really, they do a lot. It only takes 10 minutes to apply for a free Relay account and you can do it online at RelayFi.com forward slash your friend Andy. Again, that is RelayFi.com forward slash your friend Andy. Okay, let's jump into this episode. Okay, and we are back. So let's start with Nano Flips. And uh, when did you, like how long ago did you start that? And why did you create that? I started it, I guess, 2020. I sold a portfolio of small websites. Um, small being relative, just like the million dollar conversation is all relative, right? Like they were not $500 blogs, you know, some like, you know, one was doing a couple million bucks a year in revenue, but like in the scheme of, of, uh, of, uh, of things, not very big. Um, and some equity and some other brands and stuff, this little holdings company. And I was looking for, and it happened to be COVID. I sold that business. I mean, I'll never forget it. I mean, it changed. It was the biggest win of my life. July 2nd, 2020, it was the, the date we closed that transaction. And I just, before it, by the way, anyone who sells a business, it doesn't happen in like a day or a week or a month. This took like six months to, to to really happen, right? It's different for these small websites I talk about these days, but something like that, it's it's there's a lot of legal work and a bunch of stuff. So I have I preemptively knew post that being gone that I was gonna be looking at doing other stuff. And so I started tweeting about businesses I was looking at buying, these small online businesses, which for me were you know, my old business partner and I would talk about below micro, you have nano and before nano, below nano, you have pico in terms of size. Right. And so I was thinking I was, you know, thinking of micro businesses, right. Cause lower, lower, like middle market businesses are like $300 million businesses. I think that most people don't recognize that. So lower market really, you know, lower mid market being 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars. So I was thinking this is micro uh, or nano. Right. And that was the joke. Cause in, in equities, you have like micro caps, and there, there, some people joke around about nano cap stocks, right? These like tiny, you know, um, and so that was sort of where, where it came from. So I was looking at buying these businesses um, ranging from, you know, 50K to about a million bucks. And um, I had, pre be before that, I had bought a few different blogs on and off over the years. I never thought about this as like a structured thing. It was just, I was always, like I said, an internet marketing kid and, you know, had been blogging since I was, since I was a kid. And, um, then I started recognizing as I started writing about all this deal flow that people were interested in it. Um, and I didn't think that anyone else cared about, I mean, I had 700 followers at the time. I, I definitely did not have a plan to like become a micro influencer or whatever, a, a voice in this space. A nano influencer? Um, I knew about, yeah, a nano, a nano influencer, exactly. Keep on brand. It's funny, I have a friend who told me I should brand everything is um, size doesn't matter. And, <laughs> I and, like that, yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, and maybe I will one day, but so yeah. So and 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 for me, I was looking at that size, fifty k to you know about a million with some leverage. And in general, you could find at the time much more at the time opportunities ten fifteen thousand dollars because people were not super aware of it. This is also pre COVID. I had an epiphany today in the shower that the reason this became so exciting, I think, to people and got accelerated was because. I was playing in the space of buying online businesses when you, brick and mortar businesses were closing down, right? And so I had a moment of really hyper accelerated growth, I think, where like if you had been following a Cody Sanchez or a Roland Frazier or anyone who talked about buying brick and mortar businesses, you were having a tough time talking about buying laundromats in 2020, right? And, you know, or coffee shops in 2020, people literally could not go to them. People were afraid to leave the house. So I became, I think, it sort of accelerated some of the growth that I had in the space. Um, and so I felt that I had been very lucky. I was not good academically. I went to five high schools. I got kicked out of school for the first time in fourth grade. I dropped out of college, second semester, senior year to be a club promoter. School was not for me. But I did go to one of the five high schools with the right people. And one of them's fa uh, father owned an investment bank, and he wrote his first check into my old company. And um, through that process, and working very closely with them for four, four and a half years, five years, um, I learned a lot about M and A, and a lot about sort of like the value add transactions that happen, and the way that people look at pulling some of these levers that happen. And 
um, saw a lot of opportunity in this space in these micro businesses that were just, or nano businesses that people just didn't, that private equity didn't care about. Do you know what I mean? Because like, who, what are you going to do by a $10,000 blog when you have to deploy a hundred million dollars in capital? You know, um, I had a, literally had a call yesterday with, with TCG churning group and, you know, like they gave a hundred million dollars to Knight, which manages a bunch of big influencers. They started Knight Capital and they have not been able to deploy the money. That is their job is to figure out how to spend it. And so they're definitely not going to spend it on $20,000 blogs. That's for sure. Um, and small and small internet businesses. Um, anyway, so yeah, so I just started writing about things I was looking at buying and then I was started buying some more stuff, um, flipped a couple of them. And then that turned into like a whole thing. And it's the only business I built fully by accident. Um, and this newsletter, and now it's like, kind of taken over my life <laughs> in this really, really weird way. I become this, this guy, this is like the identity that I have now, but it was not on purpose. Man, that's cool. So, I mean, it's, it's crazy how much of a catalyst 2020 was for certain people. Like 2020 is when I started my YouTube channel and that ended up getting so popular that I shut down my small business that I've run for the past decade because I want to do this whole online thing instead. But 2020 was the impetus, the moment where I go, oh, this thing in the back of my head well, I have all this time now. I should probably do this thing I've been thinking about and finally like kick it off. And it's turned out to be this great decision. And it sounds like you launched it, you know, in the same, same period. I know a lot of other people who've launched their thing, you know, during that time because circumstances changed, you know, whereas conversely, I've talked to lots of people who are like, you know, 2020 terrible year, worst year ever. And like, I understand certain aspects of it were bad, but I've seen so many people who took that, you know, bad year and made something really cool out of it. So, I mean, what do you think, yeah. what do you think about that? Like how did, like what type of person does it require to do that? Or like, how does, how does that come about? I'll tell you. So I think there's a couple of things. I think that I don't, I'm not that smart. I, I'm not an idiot, but I'm not that smart. And I work hard, but I don't work the hardest. I've been, I've been sort of very lucky timing wise is what I would say. in throughout my life, a couple moments, there's a Malcolm Gladwell book called Outliers. Um, and Outliers, he talks about how basically nine out of the 10 richest people in the history of all time were born in the United States between like, and I'm going to butcher this, but between like 1860 and 1895. And it just happened to be that they were born at the start of the first industrial revolution. Right. And so they all became sort of like the Rockefellers and the Carnegie's and, you know, and they, and that, and they built this obscene, obscene, obscene wealth. Uh, and so for me, I would never compare myself to any Lumiere or Bill Gates in that one. Like he went to the one high school, like, you know, that had a computer in it. And because his mother like, work, you know, these and so these outliers that the point of these examples that Gladwell gives is that these outliers happen to just get lucky in terms of like a little bit about when they were where they were born. And so what I say about me is that to start, I just discovered the Internet, you know, when we were throwing around AOL and CompuServe CD-ROMs and Juno CD-ROMs because that's how the internet came on a 56K modem and you couldn't pick up the phone, otherwise you were disconnected. So I was just a teen who hated being in school and wanted to explore other stuff. So I discovered the internet at the right time. And so to parlay that into 2020, I think that if you were in the wrong situation, it was the worst year of your life, you know? And I think that I got very lucky that like I sold a company in, you know, in 2020 and sort of, already knew like the internet was like my world right like this was sort of and now all of a sudden we had this super internet and e-commerce for my world and we had this like super accelerated dive into that and i'd always i don't think i've held down a i don't think i've had a w2 job maybe ever i mean i did like a i did like two and a half months full time at morgan's hotel group which and i had like a w2 style job but i think i was still getting paid as a contractor i don't think i've ever had maybe i have either way you know, so so this sort of like figuring it out on your own and trying to ride sort of trends um, has just worked out well for me. So I think that, and but by chance, not 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 at all, not in any way about like seeing where the ball is going. Just like I happen to, to 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 like the stuff. So mostly for me, I hang out with m almost everyone I knew. Twenty twenty was like not bad for you know what i mean like in general and I, and I don't mean like from like a health or like horrific things happen to the world standpoint but i mean like fiscally right and i hang out with a lot of entrepreneurs as well sort of like self-made entrepreneurs and i think that like an internet entrepreneurs and if you were an internet entrepreneur 2020 2021 and 2022 were kind of a wild time and what i'm seeing now and i can tell you obviously anecdotally I don't care whether there's like a real recession happening, you know what I mean, from a GDP standpoint. I can tell you that most of the people I know that had 2020, 2021, and 2022 be the most wild years of their lives financially, 2023 has been a, 
awakening into some of the realities of what maybe the world looks like normally combined with like super high interest rates and a risk off environment where people are not spending money uh, in a risky way in the way they were. So that's my sort of take on it. Sorry, I rambled a bit. No, it's good. And yeah, uh, an awakening for, for the, that group of people or someone who happens to talk about crypto all the time on their YouTube channel, a bit of an awakening. Uh, but sure, hopefully sure. working our way through that, you know, but, uh, yes, it is. Oh, been- oh, we, we could go in, dude. I mean, I know you, I know you're mining. <laughs> I know you got it all going. I mean, listen, and I talk to my friends, Colin and Orrin about this to my, be- to my best friends all the time. We make this joke, like the day that Ohm comes back, the day that some of these, uh, like <laughs> I've been, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been compounding some of these, you know, some of these very sketchy things mm-hmm. for a few years through the bear market. But on the, on the good crypto stuff, like Bitcoin, for example, like, I was talking to my mother about this yesterday. This is not her world at all. But, you know, I first discovered crypto very early. I think I was buying stuff on the internet with something called e-gold. I used to have to go to Western Union and and wire off money to get e-gold. And people were talking about Bitcoin, like a dollar or less, you know, very, very low. And I, it was so weird to me. And I never would have held on to it. It's not like I've like missed out on my opportunity. I would have used it in a heartbeat or lost everything by that, you know. Um, but then took it seriously again, more like 2016. I found a picture from the CME. I got Bitcoin certified from, you know, from the CME because at the time, which was me thinking that there was like real institutional capital going to come into this space. I had a bunch of my friends who were investment bankers at the time convinced me to sell all my crypto, which they did. And and I think I sold Bitcoin at like 11,000 or something. You know what I mean? Like I had, it, it was, but I shouldn't have. I did, I had a little win on it. And I remember having ETH at like 270. Um, but I've really been a holder for a few years now and, and, and stacking. And my mother, I was explaining to her, I was like, people don't even understand that we're up 100% from two years ago now. You know, like I really, you know, like generally for Bitcoin. And that I really do believe 2024 is going to be a very exciting, interesting year. As I see the orange B behind you, I think that you and I are, you know, some of us will be vindicated, so to speak, you know what I yeah. mean, in in terms of, as we've all sat there with the family dinners, I sit there with my brother-in-law, who I love, you know, these partners at McKinsey who are like all making fun of cryptocurrencies. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we'll see where we are in, in a little bit of time. So up, I'm excited. Up, yeah, up 130% just this year for Bitcoin, which is is wild. But yeah, I have, um, I mean, I, I bought, I, I mined my first um crypto in 2014. I bought my first little slice of, of Bitcoin in 2014, but I didn't get really, truly serious into it until mid-2017 or so. Um, but just in the span that I've been serious about the past six years, I've had plenty of you know Thanksgiving and stuff. I know after uh, the last bull run, during the bear market, during 2019 and 2020, you know, talking to family members about Bitcoin because I'm all on board at this point, And they're like, you know, it's in it only ten thousand dollars right now. I'm like, this is a massive opportunity, and they're like, this is so stupid. And I'm like, you know, it's just at this point, I've, I've completely decided I'm not going to try to convince anybody. If they want to ask me questions, they're curious on their own. I'll talk to them, but I'm long past like I'm a you know a crypto evangelist uh, with you know friends and yeah. family. <laughs> no, and I think by the way, without getting without turning this just into like nothing but crypto, I generally do think. My perspective on this is from the Bitcoin perspective is that for the first time we are going to see like what real, real institutional capital looks like coming into the space. This is, I think, sort of the last bet at having truly, we're going to have more cycles. They're not, I don't think they're going to be crazy as before because when you have ETFs and and massive pension funds just holding just obscene amounts of it, like, like you're not going to look at volatility in the way that it existed and the way that people were just riding these cycles into like obscene wealth. I, you know, I think this is people's last run at sort of seeing these massive, massive, massive gains. Do I think that all of a sudden, maybe 20 years from now, we see a million dollar Bitcoin? Quite possibly, but I don't think it's going to be these fluctuations in the way that we saw in the past, just because as adoption becomes bigger, it's just not, no one's going to let it happen in that regard. Um, but I do think uh, it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see this time. I'm excited to see. I'm excited to see this time. And to your point, I'm no longer an evangelist. To like, I believe in it. I got my bets in it. Everyone else can do what they want, you know. Uh, so I def so I definitely have a couple more questions. I want to pick your brain about some Bitcoin and stuff uh, a bit more, but let's let's uh, uh, push that down a little bit because I want to talk about this whole sure. business thing first. Um, but I am fascinated by your take on all that stuff. Uh, so to people to people who are listening to this, who are total noobs at like buying online businesses and just operating them or improving them and maybe potentially flipping them. 
a total noob like me who have never I've never done that. I don't know anything about that world other than what I've gleaned from reading your Twitter and stuff. Can you explain like the big value proposition here and like uh, how intensive that entire process can be? Sure. So I think that from a very high level, it ranges. And I hate to give that vague answer, but the, and the value prop is very simple to me. I give that, but how in time intensive it can be is from anything from like a, a, an hour, maybe writing a newsletter once a week or writing a blog article once a week, all the way to wire cutter, right? You know what I mean? Like, you know, the online business thing is funny because e-commerce means every sort of commerce that happens on the internet, right? And so when people used to say to me, when I was mostly buying like DTC brands and stuff, people would say like, how do I get into e-commerce? And I would say, well, remove the E and think about what kind of question you're asking me, right? How do I get into commerce? That's a very, 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 very vague thing. So I think that from a high level, I often talk about blogs and newsletters, sort of little media businesses, because that's where I think most people that are new to this can actually get a win and there's some opportunity. E-commerce, in terms of what people think of as e-com, like direct-to-consumer, you know, Shopify, sort of is much more complex. You're sourcing products, you're dealing with customer, customer management, you're dealing with ads. Like So for me, I often talk about blogs and newsletters just because I think that's where the, like, the average person can get a, a bigger win. And they can find opportunities that are side hustle-y in time effort from for sub twenty five thousand dollars for 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 referencing that thread that you brought up before, and so here is the here's the big value prop and the big value prop is the same thing that all private equity has realized except for they like to use debt so which is even more of their value because they get a lot of leverage on that debt so it gets even much more exciting. You can definitely use debt. I just don't ever recommend to anyone who's never bought a business before to go sack up on 20 grand of debt to buy a 20 grand blog. I think that's a terrible idea. I'd much rather you spend five grand that you have, get your hands dirty, get deep, understand what you're getting into, and then possibly go take on some debt for something bigger if you want. But so it's just understanding exit multiples, valuation multiples, right? Like um, price to earnings ratios and in, in, in equities we're talking, or price to sales, so earnings really with these little businesses. But Let's just say, for the sake of this conversation, it's relatively true that most small internet businesses sell for about 3x um, SDE, so seller's discretionary earnings, so three times their yearly profit, right? So what the owner would take home. So that means that for every dollar a month that I can add in profit to a business, I've added $36 in value to the business. Now, all of a sudden, this becomes like a very interesting, compelling thing that people are interested in because of... because when I tell you you can buy something for five grand, that five thousand dollar thing maybe makes, I don't know, you know, one hundred fifty bucks a month, two hundred bucks a month. That doesn't sound super exciting, right? Unless you're like really interested in this. But if I tell you that you can, oh, that with an hour or two of work, you can add, uh, you know, you can double your money on that over the next six months. That sounds exciting. But people ask how. Well, I'm not asking you to then. I'm literally asking you to take something from one hundred fifty bucks a month to three hundred dollars a month. You know, we're, we're not talking about some astronomical lift here. We're talking about $5 a day, right? And so the question becomes, can you figure out where to, to get another $5 a day in profit out of this business? That is so astronomically low. I think that most people can at least conceptualize how that is possible. Um, so the real value prop, like I said, is that like there are small businesses that are under monetized or have very clear levers you can pull for more traffic, traffic being visitors. And that when things sell for multiples of their profits, that for every, you know, dollar, if something sells for three years of profit, that for every dollar a month of profit, you add $36 to the exit value of that business when you flip it. Now, 36 bucks doesn't sound so amazing, but if you add a couple zeros, it becomes much more compelling, right? So every $10 a month you add in profit, you add $360 in, in value to the business. For every $100 a month you add in profit, which is $3 a day, sorry, you know, um, the math I was doing before was wrong, $3 a day. Now $3,600 in profit. For every $1,000, 36,000, right? And so $1,000 a month in profit is 30 bucks a day, which I think most people can wrap their heads around conceptually. Like, I'm not telling you that I'm going to show you how to go make $10,000 a day. Can we have a conversation about how to go make $30 a day? Absolutely, we can have that conversation. I think that most people can wrap their heads around that being a possibility for them. So anyway, that's that's my thought. Uh, so a couple thoughts to follow up on, on that. Uh, one, I think it's it's very interesting that, uh, you know, we're both old enough to remember, you know, the AOL days and whatever and dial up in these things, that era of the internet. 
a time when, um, you know, thought leader, you know, type people in newspaper articles will talk about how no serious person will ever buy anything on the internet, how stores will never sell their stuff on the internet. We, we lived through that time and watched them all be wrong. Sure. And now, fast forward, you know, you're somebody who's seen that and lived through that. And now you're someone who's selling these sites that sell things almost as if they were just, you know, normal commodities. That's like, does, is that lost on you? Do you think about that ever? I've never thought of it like the way you just put it then, but I do I, I do think that in general, I find I get excited about what I would call not gray market, but like nascent industries, things that are like really rapidly growing that a lot of people are very skeptical about. Clearly you do too, if you're interested in crypto. Um, you know, I think that most of the money I made in my life was from an exit that really played in media sites based around cannabis. And again, I didn't, in terms of me just by accident timing things right, I got involved in cannabis in 2015 and I left cannabis in 2020. And if you anyone ever follows like equities markets, I essentially timed that market like could not be more perfect purely by accident. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, there were times people thought credit cards were insane. They're like, why would anyone use a credit card? What an insane. And so I never thought of it the way you put it just now. But yeah, I think that's one reason I like this industry now is because... I get to play in a place. I also, my moat as with nano flips um, and sort of being a creator in this space, my moat is that I'm willing to do things that my my peers will not. My peers are not going to go make a tweet thread. They're not going to make a TikTok. That's for sure. You know, some dude in an investment bank is not out here about making TikToks. And so that gives me the opportunity, right? Um, and so, no, I didn't even think of it that way, but it is, it is spot on. Yeah, it is like these little, like now I just see... I mean, you look at Flippa, there's 5,000 new listings a day. It's the main marketplace for this. That's right? crazy. It's, 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 a massive, it's a massive industry. You have bigger players too. Like at scale, you have like a Red Ventures that owns like um, Penny Hoarder, the Points Guy, mm -hmm. these massive blogs, you know? Um, and then from e-commerce, you have, I mean, Thrasio declared bankruptcy last week, but Thrasio was buying up every single Amazon FBA seller on the planet that they could. I sold a hearing aid company to a business called Open Store last year. Open store is, I don't know if it was Keith Raboy's company. I don't know if anyone knows who Keith Raboy is, but he's one of the PayPal mafia, one of the founders of PayPal. Like there are players in that there's going to be kings in this space of this sort of small micro nan nano online businesses. And uh, there's a couple of us that I think see the writing on the wall and a lot of people that don't yet. And that's where I, I think it's exciting. That's cool. So um, to rewind a little bit, you know, you, you gave an example uh, you know, if you're just starting out, you don't have very much capital, you know, don't go into debt with you know, 20 grand by that site. Maybe you just start with what you have. Maybe it's $5,000 and maybe that buys a, a site, a blog or a newsletter or something that can generate a hundred, hundred fifty dollars a month. Is that for a complete newbie who's you know, just going to, is that an actual realistic metric for something you could expect or find? Sure. A hundred percent. So, I mean, I think the, the realistic metric that people need to expect those that they're buying like a little side hustle. They're not buying, you know, you know, what I tell people all the time is that if you want passive income, you walk into invest in AT&T. They've been giving out a 6% dividend yield for 30 years straight or something, right? Like that this is not a hundred percent passive income. I think that like, uh, I call it semi-passive income, right? Like if you want to, it's a, you can make it happen for a couple hours a week. Now that couple hours a week is probably just going to maintain that right? Maybe you can improve it over six months and get a flip out of it, right? Um, but in general, you are not replacing, like, my audience is not the zero to one people. It's not the, like, how do I pay my rent crowd, right? And I, and I want to, like, actively push those people away from me because not that I, like, not that I have any problem with that crowd. It's just that, like, I don't want you to buy into the mindset that I'm trying to sell you if you're having a hard time paying your bills, right? Like, if, if you need the five thousand dollars really badly, don't go buy a blog with it, right? Like you know, because like making one hundred fifty bucks a month, you're going to be pretty upset. You know what I mean? That you only make one hundred fifty bucks a month of that. So, um, I think that's really a, super good advice. Uh, no matter what, like for investing in general, like don't yeah, <laughs> like don't you know uh, if you're in debt and you can barely you're living paycheck to paycheck, don't be investing in a crypto or buy stuff, you know, like get your situation fixed, get your income raised to get an emergency fund or some way to buffer yourself. You're not going to credit card debt just to like do things and then start exploring like opportunities. Agreed. Agreed. And I think, 
I don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a burn the ships kind of guy, but I just don't preach that to people so much. I mean, I'm a bit of a, like, you know, like I, I, I'm down to go for broke, but I don't, I have a risk tolerance that most people do not have. Um, and I would not, and I also have no children or like spouse. So it's, it's a lot easier for me to be like, Oh, if it all burns, it all burns. Um, but I would say, you know, in this scheme, when I talk about 25 to becoming wealthy, it's just because like I recognize, you know, barring some riding the cycle correctly to to that point, right? Like, you know, with Bitcoin, barring buying a altcoin very, very early, which is just for most people, again, if you have five thousand dollars, you got twenty thousand dollars, you know, maybe maybe you catch a crazy multiple on some altcoin that rides, but like it's just, I mean, that's like penny stocks. Some of them ride, most of them will not. You know what I mean? And mo and you know, and many will, people will lose their shirt in that process. And it'll be a consistent transfer of wealth from people that have money to people that don't have money. I mean, from people that don't have money to people that have money again, again, again. So my thought has always been like, if you can spend 20 grand and I can show you how to take that 20 grand and create a little side hustle that whether for now you keep as the cash flow and you just like, maybe that goes 300 bucks, 500 bucks a month into your 401k or, you know what I mean? Like it's a fun side hustle hobby and maybe you grow it into a thousand bucks a month and sell it for, you know, 36 grand. Like that, like that you can learn those principles and then expand upon that into becoming wealthy. Right. And, and it's really just an idea that I believe that all wealth comes from equity. Essentially there are, I know a lot of millionaires, very, 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 very few of them. And equity can be ownership in anything in that regard. Very, 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 very few of them I know became multimillionaires from a paycheck. I mean, just almost none. And if they did, they were partners in their firms and they got distributions because they had equity in their firms, right? And so I think that for the most people, um, equity is almost impossible to get. Any sort of meaningful equity that you can control what happens to it is, is almost impossible to get. So I sort of preach buying these small businesses, but it's not for everyone. It's really, really not for everyone. I, you know, and I've, rec I've had to recognize that over the past couple of years is that like, this is not the right thing for everyone for the right person. I think it's amazing. You know what I mean? Like it speaks volumes to them and it will show them a whole different world. They didn't even realize existed, but for the wrong person, I would run away from everything I talk about as far as possible. Yeah. So, I mean, I think like, can you with a nine to five job become wealthy Yes, of course, but it's probably going to take you way longer. You're, you're going to hit that like wealthy like status when you're age 55, 60, 65. And I think as even though your tweet reads a little bit controversial, I was trying to you know, have a little fun with it. Uh, I completely agree. Like if, you know, if you look at my messaging and stuff, do I think crypto is an incredible way to build, you know, wealth much faster than other things? Yes, but I always before getting into crypto, before getting into stocks, I always advocate one thing which is build a business, whether it's a side hustle, a side business, whatever, or it's buying websites and learning how to run them and operate them and improve them and flip them, whatever. I feel like doing that is one of the most powerful like dials you can turn all the way up to 11 before any of the other things because um, it's it seems so basic and it's so like a duh, you dummy, but more income equals more opportunities to make the investments work for you. And if you're just like doing like, yeah. 10 bucks a week or 50 bucks a week or something into investments, that's awesome. And over time, it will turn into something cool. But figure out how to turn that to 500 or 5,000. And that's where stuff like this is really interesting. And I was asking about that like um, $5,000 you know, blog uh, example, because that's a 36% return, $150 a month. And that's like, that's interesting. Yeah. Any to, Most yeah, people yeah, I mean, it should so that's, be. That's, that's what I always say to people is like, because that's why my crowd is much more than like, oh, I have money in my 401k. I'm interested in investing in alternative asset classes, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's who I speak volumes to. Because if I can show you that like you have, like we talk about dividend yields, for example, like 36% cash on cash return, I think most people will be flabbergasted by if, as long as you understand normal investment metrics, right? And so what I will say though, is it is not fully, fully, fully passive at 36%, right? There is some maintenance that goes into it. Um, have I owned sites that I didn't touch for six months? Yes. Would I ever recommend that to someone? Absolutely not. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just, you're asking for a disaster, you know? Um, but what I would say is that like, and that's unlevered. I mean, without getting into the complexities, that's just straight cash. Right. And so and if you ever want to raise money to do or raise debt to do some of the stuff I talk about, totally possible. I've a hundred percent bought businesses 10% at a time, essentially, right. With, of equity at a time. 
you're definitely going to have, before anyone gives you money, they're going to ask you what your experience is. So if you, there's no, when people come to me and like, oh, I want to take out 400 grand to buy this blog or this e-commerce business. And I say, well, have you done this before? And they're like, no. Well, you have to have like a realistic outlook on who's going to give you that money. I'm not writing you a $400,000 check to run some business you know absolutely nothing about, right? But if you go, if, if somebody came to me and say, hey, I've bought, you know, three blogs before, one for 5,000, one for 18,000, one for 12,000, we grew them, you know, one was a break even or we lost 10% on the other two, we grew 2x, 3x, right? Like, and I need, and I'm raising capital, I might be very inclined to invest in you, right? And now all of a sudden, or to lend you money. But what's exciting about that is that like, I mean, sort of, the, this is the, this is how all real estate, you know, this is, I mean, this is, this is how all value-added real estate plays work with leverage with debt, right? Is that like, if you can put down 10% cash, for example, let's say you bought a, a million dollar business that was doing, or we'll do the math before, is it a 5,000, no, it's too small, $100,000 business that you put down 10K to buy, right? And that business is making 3K a month, let's just say, to, or 2,500 bucks a month. Put down 10K and I bring like 30K, I have a 300% cash on cash return year one. I, I don't even want to like, put that thought in people's minds because it gets people so hyped like i should just take out debt to buy one of these but like yeah i think it's from a cash on cash return it is going to beat almost every other asset class on the planet um in terms of you can have actual input into how it works for you um and also you there's just not you can't do that with real estate there's no you can't buy a house for five grand it's just not possible and i bought a house when i sold my house in 20 when i sold my business in 2020 i bought a house i was like i'm gonna build a rental portfolio this is what people do with money i i could tell you that story at the end of time i was i can't build ikea furniture you know so like me like tearing down basically a full tear down gut reno adding a floor adding a bedroom adding two bathrooms nine months later one hundred fifty thousand dollars over budget basically you know, I was overwhelmed to say the least and uh, decided to sell the house instead of build the portfolio. I mean, real estate is just so you're just taking on so much with like real estate that kind of in that in that in that proposition for an investment. But I feel like this is a lot of what you're saying, minus the acquiring, which you can. I know you can do this, too, with YouTube channels, but this is analogous to YouTube and why I love YouTube. Um, it's not passive income. It is semi-passive. I put in a certain number of uh, hours of work a week on my channel. I put that chain, that video out into the world and then it does the work for me. That The video is 100% yeah. passive. It hands off after that point, just like a blog article or something you put out there. But you got to keep producing them and you got to keep tweaking the website and SEO and all these things. Um, so, but, and if you enjoy that part, th these things are really interesting in terms of like, oh, maybe I should, you know, check this out. So, on that note, if someone's listening to this and they're, okay, James is making a lot of sense. This sounds really cool. Um, I want to, uh, you know, dip my toes into learning about this. What's step one to getting into this world? I mean, on some sh shameless self-promotion, nanoflips.com is a newsletter where I write about this stuff. But I think I would just, what I recommend for people is, um, they just like walk the neighborhood. So what I mean by that is like, when you look at real estate, if you were to buy a house, you wouldn't just go buy some random house without knowing what the comps looked like, without knowing sort of what the neighborhood looked like. So just start looking around acquire.com, flipper.com, empireflippers.com, FE International, you know, Quiet Light. There's tons of them. Motion Invest. You should go see what is out there. Go see what people, and go look at sold listings, not what's for sale. Because what's for sale, and a lot, brokerages are different, but marketplaces like Flippa, you're going to find a lot of trash. So look at what's sold. Look at sort of what reputable sellers are selling, people that have good feedback that have done this multiple times, brokers. And I think that'd be the, your first step in sort of getting some understanding. And one thing I do want to be clear about is I've also bought and sold theme page networks, right? Like we're just in Instagram channels. You know, the most recent one I did, I just, most recent one I did was 1.2 million followers. Um, so not the same as YouTube because YouTube is very much your face, but we have a shorts channel right now that we're growing. It's getting 10,000 views a short, which is not super and crazy. I understand for shorts can be nutty, but um, that is no humans at all. It is an AI voice with mid journey created images on top of text that we have, you know? And so I do think, by the way, when I think about these online businesses, I think that, Andy, I think you play in e-commerce. You know, I think it's just in a different way, right? You are getting commerce through the E, through the internet, right? Like, and I think that like, um, obviously you couldn't, you know, you're not going to go flip your channel because it's so specific to you. And that's what happens with creator brands. But 
there are people that buy and sell YouTube channels, right? There are people that buy and sell theme page networks on Instagram. And so I think it, for me, I just always, I think it's the easiest way for me to get you indoctrinated into this is, is a blog or a newsletter because you can be sort of anonymous and you don't have to show your face and stuff. But I love all of it is my point. Like I'm pretty obsessed with all of it. Um, so how I would go check out Nano Flips and then I would really just go check out sort of what people are selling, what has already been sold. Because you might find that YouTube is the thing for you. You might find that you want to go create news with some AI that like puts out YouTube videos. I wouldn't, you probably won't do well unless you have a lot of input into it with that. Um, you might find a blog is most interesting to you. You might find that you really love the idea of buying an e-commerce brand. I have a good friend of mine, Colin, who's actually the first person ever brought you up to me, Colin Landforce, um, uh, has his wife, Kelsey. I love Kelsey. Love them both. She was leaving her job at um, Cameo and she was looking for a side hustle essentially because they had just had a baby. They wanted, she wanted to be home with the baby, which she wanted to have a job and sort of, and um, anyway, I sort of brokered the bit, uh, purchase of a e-commerce brand to her. Um, that is a sick brand and crushes it, you know? And I, she was just prepared to take that on. She'd worked in agency world, Collins of great entrepreneur as well. So they sort of understood the mechanics of e-commerce and running paid ads and creating content, you know? Um, but it doesn't just have to be sort of, uh, the blogs. It can be sort of much more complex than that is my point. But so yeah, go walk the, go walk the neighborhood, go look what things are selling for, go look what comps in the neighborhood go for. Because when people go want to buy a business, when they go buy a blog or an e-commerce brand, whatever it is, like, I'd be like me walking into a house and having no idea what similar houses were selling for. You know what I mean? It would just be a huge mistake. You could sell me on whatever valuation you thought it should be. And so that's how I'd say it would be the first, first steps. It'd be like newsletters from me and like following me on social and literally just looking at what is selling on all the different marketplaces. And like, I don't know, poke the bear. You know what I mean? Like send out some questions to the sellers. See, you know, get get a good understanding. Yes, I uh, I will vouch for you and say definitely if you're listening to this and you like what's being said, go follow him on Twitter, TikTok, sign up for the email. It's all amazing stuff. And yes, uh, the man, the myth, the legend, the land force has been on the podcast here too. Love Colin. He's awesome. Yeah, his wife's story with uh, that little side business that's less of a side business now is is super cool. Um, so I love that. So in in the entirety of your experience doing this, you know, buying these businesses with the ones you just keep running and the ones that you flip, how many of these properties have you, have you exchanged? Like how many have you sold and bought sure. and like gone through? So I think the last time I counted was 16, but you have to, to be completely candid, like a good chunk of that came from a portfolio I sold in 2020. Um, and now I've been involved in like a lot more transactions, like advising other people, but like that have gone through me. So my, my, like sh my sticky tagline is two exits, a thousand failures. And so, and it's really been three exits, but one was like pretty small. And when I was like 19, it was 20, 19. And it was this little ad network that I had built and it fell apart as soon as the buyer bought it. Um, but irrelevant. Um, but when I think about these exits and there's no big difference, right? These exits are just in my mind, they're bigger. So they feel like an exit, right? Like the portfolio of sites was a bigger exit, right? So that felt like an exit to me, but I've really sold, it's most of these sites are also asset sales. Not, you don't really buy the business, not, not to get too into the weeds with it, but like you're not buying the LLC or the S Corp, you buy the assets. Um, so you're buying like the domain name, you're buying all the content, you're buying all the, that's for um, a whole myriad of reasons. But 16 was the last time I counted, ranging from like a $400 dog Frisbee blog that I did last year as I tried to do a public case study just to show people that like, because I had sold this portfolio of sites for like 30 million bucks. And I thought that like me and a bunch of people, I didn't get $30 million to be really candid. And I was at a bunch of partners. I was diluted down. It was some stock, some cash on the exit. Anyway, point is, I always feel like I need to caveat that because everyone's like, whoa. Um, but I wanted to prove to people that forget sub 25K, that sub a thousand bucks, if you really just want to get your hands dirty, I'm a firm believer the best way to learn is by doing, right? So you want to learn about running a blog. You want to learn about buying small internet businesses. You go buy a $500 blog and see what it's like. It already gets 30 visits a day or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, and just be able to understand. Because a lot of these changes, if you have nothing, do nothing, right? So if I want to tell you to remonetize something or change your ad network, that doesn't make a difference if you have zero traffic. But it, it's, so anyway, um, but ranging from like, a $400 blog about dog frisbees that I bought with Bitcoin, actually, 
um, from a from a really nice guy in Pakistan because egg is also no PayPal in Pakistan. Um, and that I sold eleven months later, bestdogfrisbee.com, I think it was called, for twelve hundred bucks. And you know, I mean, cash on cash, I did great on that deal. You know, what I mean, in terms of like time, Colin and our our our, our very good mutual friend Oren would like make fun of me every night because I'd be like you know, click clacking away on an article about like chew toys that was going to make me like an extra dollar 20 a cents or something, you know, a month, you know, and, um, it just wasn't worth the effort to me except to show, I wanted to show people what could be doable for small. So ranging from like $400 blog, I bought Bitcoin to, you know, uh, I have it here on my shelf, an e-commerce brand called Blue Angels Hearing that we sold for about a million dollars to open store to DMO, which was a holdings company with a bunch of sites in it that we sold for a lot more. Um, but I think 16 was the last time I counted. Maybe it's eight, 17 or 18 now, but, um, and then across yeah. those is, uh, do you, is there an average like time from acquisition to the sale, um, across those? So the answer is not at all. <laughs> and I, 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 w I, w <laughs> I wish there was, and, um, partially because I didn't think about this as being like a structured thing for a long mm. time. I, I actually believe that the people that I know that have bought into my mindset do better by not worrying about the sale so much as they just want to build, they want to buy and build portfolios of businesses. And when they see an opportunity for an exit, they take it. Um, every business has its exit, whether you like it or not. Every business in the history of all time has gone out of business at some point, right? And that's just the reality. The Dutch East India Company sure doesn't exist anymore. Um, and my feeling is that, like, I, I just get bored too. You know, like there's some things that, things I've bought as a flip. I bought a theme page network, i.e., like a bunch of Instagram pages with millions of followers. I intending on selling that. That we sold about a week later. And that was a little different, made like 20 grand, but it was like, I, I knew there was a buyer who was interested in this stuff and I saw an opportunity to buy something. And I, so I bought them and we flipped those. Um, but what I will say is that timelines, you need at least six to 12 months for the flip. And it's just because things are going to be valued on their trailing 12 months of revenue or trailing 12 months of profit. So I can make a change to a site and make a thousand dollars a month more today. That's going to be, no, no seller is going to come I mean, no buyer's going to come along and be like, amazing. I made mean, $1,000 more last month. I'm going to pay you a multiple on that. No, they want to see that that exists and that will continue to exist. Um, and so then like the portfolio sites was like a hodgepodge, but that was like a five-year thing for me. You know, I mean, that was the biggest win I ever had, but that was like a five-year win for me. Um, first flip, I think probably was I bought something called Upload Forever with a four in the middle, uploadforever.com. I saw like 17, 18. And that became part of Liquid Offers, which was the ad network that I had. And we sold that. Um, that was probably about a year. But so I would say in general, like if you want to buy something, improve it and sell it, you need 12 months to, to do it. Um, so which, by the way, also inherently pushes many, many people away from the stuff I'm trying to sell you. Do you know I mean the stuff I'm trying to teach you about? Because people are like, oh, I don't want to wait 12 months to do that. You know what I mean? Like, so anyway. Super the same in the investing world. The crypto world's like, no one's... Yeah, patience pays. It's like it's cliche, but it's true. Um, it depends on what you how do you define that patience. So you know, if if you were somebody who was newer and you wanted to start by buying, you know, a blog, you start learning learning from you, you learn some of the basics. Uh, how how are you typically for like a blog, for example, um, monetizing that? Is it just AdSense and affiliates? Is it more than that? Yeah. So I'd say that with blogs, I mean. Blogs, what I'll tell you is that this has actually changed a lot. You guys don't have this opportunity with YouTube because it's all ingrained into Google in a different way. But with a blog, you can sort of choose the, like the ad network that's sitting on top of it, essentially, right? So YouTube, you're just getting Google ads, right? Not that it's bad, but I can tell you that YouTube, uh, Google is, um, it's fine. They're the biggest. There's ways to make more money than that. And so when we talk about display ads on a blog, for example, I'll often push people, and this opportunity existed a lot years ago. It's gone a bit now, um, to switch from AdSense to like Mediavine or AdThrive or Ezoic. And that's just because they set up something called like header bidding. And all these, they're really more like ad ops companies, ad optimization companies. And so they will include AdSense. For example, if you're on AdThrive and you're getting, you know, uh, display ad money, i.e. like banner ad money on your site, AdSense is there as well as ads.com, a hundred other ad networks and they are bidding live for placement on your website and whoever wins that bid will get that placement so you end up with higher rpms and if if google is willing to pay you the most and adsense is willing to pay you the most you will get 
the, the AdSense ad will show up there. Um, but so that's one of the obvious ways is display. What I would tell everyone is that display or AdSense, for example, for this example, is the most passive income source there is. It, but also you are giving up a piece of money because somebody else is brokering that to you, right? I used to own an ad network, right? So the broker has to make money. So Google's taking 40 cents on every click, for example. I think that's the average last time I, I was reading about this. Um, affiliates and, and display are going to be the two main ones you go for. If you're really big, you can sort of run your own products. I would say that's pretty unlikely. It's, it's fantastic if you can make it happen, but it's pretty unlikely. Um, but yeah, there's tools like I'll just plug Lasso. Like Lasso is a great tool. If people have Amazon Associates on there, which is their affiliate program, check out Lasso. It's just a tool that allows you to sort of like highlight the right product that makes it much increases click through rates and makes things look prettier and nicer, and you'll get more um, affiliate revenue. And if you're using something like AdSense, I would switch it out to like MediaVine or Ezoic or AdThrive, though they have traffic minimums. Um, but yeah, those are the most simple ways. If you if you have like a specific niche. Selling information products, education products can be fantastic. If you, I would also switch it out. Like if you are selling soccer goals, I don't know. I mean, you know, like maybe Amazon is going to give you 3%, but you could probably cut a deal with the soccer goal, you know, manufacturer and, and get way more than 3%, you know? Um, so, but that's really a lot of what this thesis is, is like just to find most people are lazy. And, and so it's just like, are you willing to put in a little bit of extra work? And by the way, if I tell you that it's going to take you 10 hours of work to figure out how to make $50 more a month, you might say no, because it's 50 bucks more. But then if I convince you and show you that 50 bucks more a month means $1,500 more, $2,000 more when you flip it, I say, will you put in 10 hours of work now for $2,000 when you sell it? You know, you, you might say yes. Right. And, and not just that, um, if I tell you that you can put in that work when you leave work or on the weekend on a Sunday afternoon or from your laptop on the beach, which is the, the classic shtick, I, although I'm not like a big beach and laptop kind of guy myself, then that becomes much, much more compelling, right? Um, and so, so yeah, so that's how most of the blogs are monetized. I also think that for big blogs, if people have the money, you've learned the opportunity, they should be building news, uh, newsletters off these blogs. Like if you have a website that gets 200,000 visitors a month, you should be having somewhere to capture those visitors and bring them back again and again and again. Communities are something I'm trying to play with as well because that's, I mean, I grew up with forums. Forums were just the, the, the communities of the day, the discords of the, of the day. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that as well. I miss the world of forums, online forums. That's, uh, yeah, lots of fond memories there. Yeah, and plus there's the element of... Um, of compounding, I think people overlook with something like this because you know you spend that time to make that extra fifty dollars a month or whatever from you know that ar that article or that collection of articles you put out. But then as you put more out on the blog and more people come and they read it, then they read other articles that are related, and then all of a sudden that fifty goes to a hundred or a hundred and fifty. The same with videos and anything else. The more you put out there, the yeah. more eyes you get on it, the more it makes. It's just how it works. And by the way, the algorithm, if we're talking about search, right, like Google, for example, I'm assuming the same with YouTube. The, from, from my understanding of these algorithms, which, by the way, is better than most, but I will not pretend that I know how the algorithm works because they don't share that on purpose, right? But from what I've seen with organic social I've done well with and with Google is that the more output you have, the more their algorithm likes you as well. Right, like it is not. They are interested in in creators, so to speak. Whether you're creating on a blog or creating on YouTube or creating on on TikTok, that are pretty consistent. That are putting out more and more. Um, and we have in Google for for organic search for SEO perspective, we have and I'm sure it exists in YouTube as well. We have what's called topical authority, right? Which is that if I've got tons of articles on one topic, it convinces Google that I might actually be an authority on said topic, and that they should all rank higher because it's not just me talking about one thing and you're interlinking them too. I'm sure with YouTube, you can link to another video at the end. You know, you can say, maybe you like this one. Same with, with, with Google, same with search, right? Like if you read an article about like the top 10 running shoes, well, in the top 10 running shoes, you might find a link that says like, and here's your best way to increase your 5k, right? That might be a thing. And you link to that to another page in your blog or your site. And then the, the, the flywheel continues and continues and continues. Yeah, and then so let me ask you this question. I have a personal, selfish question to ask. Sure. I've got the YouTube channel. I've got the Twitter. I've got the newsletter. Uh, 
should you know should my videos should should I create a blog? Should my videos also be blog posts? Like, is there a connection there? Is that worth my time and, and effort? I think you. I think if you've got the bandwidth, I love, I, you know, I think that, yes. I mean, if you've got the bandwidth, I, I can't promise you what will come from it because I don't know how much keyword research. What, I said someone posted today about how the, the keyword research they do for YouTube and so much YouTube shows up in Google search now mm -hmm. um, is pretty similar to the keyword research they do for Google. Um, and that like, if there's Google volume, there's probably YouTube volume for that same search term, right? Um, so what I would tell you is that like, there are so many tools and we could definitely talk about it after this that now I wouldn't say that you should go spend three or four hours creating each article, but do I think that you could take, and this is where AI gets exciting to me. I'm not, a, I'm not saying AI should just take over a human job, but there are some interesting tools where I could take one of Andy's videos, summarize it, get it turned into a blog post. You could human edit it and make it sound like Andy, right? And make it sound good and optimize it 30 minutes of time, right? And that like, is it going to unequivocally be number one on Google? I, I can't promise you that, but like, do I think you'd pick up some extra traffic here or there? And and what my my most recent thesis with, with, with blogs is they need to become little media companies, right? So like, if Andy's a little media company, right? Beyond just YouTube and social, like it's not gonna hurt you to have a blog as well, right? And I've seen friends who are creators who now are selling when they sell sponsorships, not just sponsor the YouTube, but sponsor the YouTube, sponsor my newsletter, sponsor, you know, and it's this package you get. It's sort of omni-channel approach. And so my answer to you is that if you've got the bandwidth, if you could figure out a decent SOP to do it simply, then you could even have someone on your team do it pretty lightly if you had a team or you could hire some, you know, um, they, not a terrible idea. Okay. I like that a lot. Uh, I've, yeah, I thought about it and that, and all the things you're saying make it the entire like blog thing, you know, blogs aren't dead. It's, it's very interesting. Um, here, as we kind of get towards the end, I, I want to um, get another tweet of yours uh, and sure. uh, get some thoughts on it. Uh oh, there's like 70,000. So when someone, whenever someone says that, I like <laughs> cringe, like, oh, what did I tweet from the hip that people are going <laughs> to I did actually look up some of your uh, uh, oldest tweets and stuff. Uh, I don't know if I'll have time to get into uh, uh, some of that. I did, I did. Uh, one of your earliest tweets on Twitter uh, was, I ain't no hipster, but I can make your hipster, <laughs> <laughs> which I love because that uh, tells so me funny. you're either or were a Mac Miller fan or you just have a lot of confidence in your swagger, which I like both answers. There. I, first of all, Andy, I now for my own sake in comedy need to go back. I think that's one <laughs> thing that's fascinating about Twitter is like, because it's not refined, right? Like there yep. is in, in the modern version of X Twitter, right? We all have these like people are thinking about content. But when, you know, I had a moment where I was like, oh my God, like there is years of when you have 10 people follow you, you just tweet whatever, and you're a, a drunk kid at a club and you're 22, you just tweet whatever you want. You know yep. what I mean? And then you go back on it later, and you're like, oh my God, I can't. Let me tell you right now. I would never be elected to office. That, that, that's for <laughs> sure. You know, that's that's for sure. Oh yeah, my personal Twitter, which I is not the same as my current Twitter account. My the one I started when I first found out about Twitter in I don't know, 2010 or 2011, uh, what, a couple of years after it was launched, is very different than my current one. So yeah, it's like we all go through these phases. Uh, but the one I want to talk about uh, is is not one that's embarrassing or anything. I at least don't think so. I really like this tweet. Um, it's from back in October. And you said, uh, making money is extremely easy, but it's also extremely hard. Anyone who has really made money will know what I mean by this. And uh, I love this tweet. Um, but, you know, I've, I've had a little bit of success with making money, you know, not as much as other people out there. Uh, and this has a certain meaning to me. But I think it probably means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But, you know, you wrote sure. this. So I'm curious what what this tweet means to you or what it meant to you when you wrote it. Well, it's funny because I don't remember exactly what it meant to me when I wrote it. I do know the tweet you're talking about, but I, even when I think about it and you ask me, it means several things to me as well, right? And it's probably why it resonated as a tweet, which is a great organic sort of lesson in how do you create like written <laughs> yeah, organic right? content. If you can say something that resonates on multiple different ways to different people, it probably, probably works. Um, when I think about it now, what I think is that like a couple of different ways to take it. One of them is that like when... Things are going right and you figure it out. It is just obscene. Some things just, I, I'm very much a fan of this concept of like about momentum. 
kind of like law, like inertia, like an object in motion, like stays in motion, sort of this sort of, and so when you have things that are just moving, it's much easier to make money than when you have are at a total standstill. Zero to one, and this is actually part of the, the thesis of Nanoflips, right? Zero to one is the hardest part in the world. One to two is much easier. You know, it's much easier to, to, to own something that already has traction, that has product market fit, that has a customer that you understand than it is to find that customer. So that's one version of it, I think, when I think about it now about, you know, sometimes things are just super, super easy um, when things have momentum versus starting from zero. The other side of it is like that I just genuinely believe that most of myself included very much overcomplicate how hard it is to make money. We make these sort of grand plans with multiple steps that this and this has to happen. And some of the things that I've done that made the most money were just like the easiest things in the world for me to do. Um, but I, I mean, I guess you have to go through the hard to get there. Um, but it comes from this place of like, it sounds so cheesy. I kind of believe in all this stuff, but you take a step back, like, I, I, like, I love video games as a kid. I still play some as an adult, but as a kid, I love video games. And just like the moment that you start realizing this is all, I was having a conversation last night, not to totally digress, but it will make sense about how many Earth-like planets exist in the Milky Way galaxy and how many galaxies exist. And we end up with like billions of trillions of potential like, 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 like Earth-like planets. And then you think about the expanse of time Right. And so what you realize is this is all in my take, this is all ridiculous, meaningless stuff we're doing anyway. And so the overwhelming urge we all have to overcomplicate everything and worry about what everyone thinks and worry about whether it's going to work or not is, is what makes most of this hard. And that most of this is actually pretty easy. Like if you go and you go create a YouTube video every week for a long enough time and you like just are logical about it, you start thinking about like, what are the things that might be an interesting niche that can be monetizable and which worked and which didn't? Like, it's not overly insanely complexly hard to do. It is hard to put in the effort to get there, right? Um, but I think we, and then the other, the last piece I'll give from my takeaway of what I may have meant by that is, uh, I mean, I meant it much more like existentially, like sort of like, like, you know, this sort of like, it should not, people overcomplicate this and it's, when things are easy, they're really easy. And when they're hard, they're almost impossible. Um, but, the last piece is that like people try and create these. I gave up on unicorns for sure. I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not Bill Gates. I'm not building a deck of corn. I don't want to change the world. Like I, I, I mean, it'd be nice, but I just don't think that that's, I think that's what it becomes really hard. And I'm 35. My generation grew up in just like VC land and sort of everyone just raising all this crazy money. And like, if you want to just go and build, like you want to make a couple million bucks a year, Building a small business that makes a couple million dollars, like there are a million formats that you can follow. Saturation is not real. It is 100% doable. It is just, do you go and follow this and do this? It's really hard, but in the scheme of like what's hard in life, like it's pretty easy. And when you have that momentum, it's easy. Like, and when you have audience as an example, I'm not going to do it right now, but if I wanted to make $10,000 tomorrow, I probably could. And that's a ridiculous thing to say. And I don't want, it sounds like almost offensive, but if you have any sort of audience that's interested in what you say, if you figure out the right levers, you can, there are ways that like, if I ever needed 10 grand, I would, I probably could come up with it. Right. Um, and that'd be very easy, but it's also really hard to get to a place to figure out how to make it that easy. So anyway, I know that's not a, a concrete answer, but I hope, hopefully it gives a couple different perspectives of what I've made meant by it. No, I love that. I, I love your example about the, you know, the, the, uh, earth-like planets and stuff. I mean, if you, if you look at one of the Hubble or one of the James Webb Telescope deep fields uh, images and you have a true understanding of what exactly you're looking at, all the problems we have here seem a lot less significant than they feel. You know, just the they're scope nothing. of it. They're nothing. And and when you combine that with what I think is the greatest marketing tagline of all time, which is just do it. Yeah. You know, I think that like, I mean, a lot of my missteps in this life have come so much about worrying. I mean, I have my journal next to me. I'm sure I have... If I can't find it in three seconds, I won't find it because I don't want it to to hold us back. But, um, you know, I think somewhere I have some like stop, don't, you know, like don't worry about what people think of you, essentially, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's so much, and a lot of that is, comes from being a creator, you know? But so much of that comes from, uh, when I talk about the the Earth-like planets, that's what I'm, this is irrelevant. I mean, for my view of the world, you know, like my view of the universe, like maybe we come back, maybe we don't, my personal view, 
I don't think I'm going to have another recollection of being here. If I do, if I've been here before, I don't remember it. So I don't know, you know, and I have no recollection of life outside of this. So this is either my first go at this or my only go at this, or we don't have any memory of it. Um, and so using that and then using that, so that mindset combined with how big the world is, I think a lot of us, when it comes to making money, get in our own way because we overcomplicate what we think we need to do to get there. Um, we overcomplicate how much we worry about what people think about us. We, you know, like most people don't take risks because there's people in their lives judging them. But when you truly can grasp the idea that no one cares what you do, they're thinking about themselves all the time, that we are nothing but a blip on a rock that is nothing in the giant expanse of everything, and that a hundred years after you die, no one will ever say your name ever again in the perpetuity of time that you might as well just go with unbridled passion towards what you want to do and what you think will work. And, um, I think that that's very hard to do, but making money becomes much easier when you can start to do that. Man, I love all that. And I think that I'm fired up. I think that is the perfect place to just book in this thing. Uh, James, this was super fun. I mean, I have like a thousand other questions to ask you about all this different stuff. So maybe we'll just do a follow-up in the future, uh, for the, uh, the episodes here. But, um, I love all the things you shared. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, and I'll continue to follow and point everybody into the description to find all the links to all of James's stuff. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Andy.